Hi team and welcome to our video about uh, quantitative traits. So we're going to talk about quantitative traits or traits that don't fall into um, one category or the other. So an example of a qualitative trait would be like red or white. Um, something that would be like spotted or solid. These are, you can put the individual into one category or the other. But with a quantitative trait, you're going to have more of a spread of phenotypes. And typically, this is underlain by multiple genes. We're going to talk about what that looks like today. So if we first consider a single gene trait, um, and we do a cross between a big A little a times big A little a individual, we're going to get one big A big A offspring, one little a little a offspring, and two more who are heterozygous for both. So we've got sort of this triangle appearance here. If we consider um, two loci now and do a cross between dihybrids, we're going to get the smallest number of individuals who are homozygous on each side and the greatest number of individuals who are heterozygous at all loci. We can see a similar trend, all homozygous on each end and all heterozygous when we look at even more traits, five loci in this case, and when we stop being able to distinguish between the phenotype categories, many loci or multiple genes are going to be involved in determining this phenotype. So an example of phenotype like this would be height, uh, weight, your skin color, maybe eye color, um, lots of examples. So many things. The fewest individuals are going to be homozygous for either type of trait, either homozygous all recessive or homozygous all dominant. Most individuals are going to fall somewhere in the middle here and have an intermediate phenotype. So let's talk about an example of that. <clears throat> if we consider skin color, so here we're looking at two individuals, one who is homozygous for all um, dominant alleles and has very dark skin, and one who is homozygous for all recessive alleles and has very light skin. If we look at the offspring of these two individuals in the F1 generation, as we've come to expect, the individuals are completely heterozygous, and in this case, they have an intermediate phenotype. So this isn't a, a typical Mendelian trait when we have um, dominant alleles conferring the dark phenotype. This would be more like an incomplete dominance trait. So if we cross together two F1 individuals, we're going to get a huge range of genotypes in the F2. So here are our genotype possibilities. And you can see that with each genotype, we get a range of very light to very dark with most individuals somewhere in the middle for skin color. And we can sort of turn this into a graph, um, a normal curve of considering how many in the population are going to have each phenotype. And then the range of phenotypes from very light to very dark. And remember what we discussed a minute ago, the individuals with the darkest skin are going to be homozygous. The individuals with the lightest skin are going to be homozygous, but most of the population is going to be somewhere in the middle. So they have an intermediate phenotype, and they also have an intermediate genotype, maybe like big A, little a, little b, little b, big C, little c. All right, so let's do... Um, this, this example is pretty straightforward because I'm telling you there are three genes involved in it. But if we saw a phenotype like this, a phenotype with a range of possible outcomes, how many, how could we determine how many genes are involved in that phenotype? So let's do a practice problem. 
So we're going to consider mouse tail length in our practice problem. But I want you to first remember that if we cross together big A, big A, times little a, little a, we're going to get an F1 individual who's heterozygous. And if we cross little a, big A, little a together, we're going to get one quarter of the offspring being homozygous dominant, one half being heterozygous, and one quarter being homozygous recessive. So... In our F2 here, one quarter of the individuals resemble the recessive parent. One quarter of the individuals resemble the dominant parent, or I guess it would be the grandparent in this case. So we're considering the um, rarest individuals, the homozygous individuals. Um, and remember that one quarter look like um, the parental generation. So now let's think about our mouse example. We're going to take two mice um, whose tail lengths differ by 16 centimeters. Okay, So we've got the long parent. Let's say their tail length is 26 centimeters in length. And the short parent, their tail length is 10 centimeters in length. Okay. We're going to cross these guys together and get an F1. And then in the F2, we're going to look at the phenotypes. So in the F2, we have 500 mice. Two individuals have a 10 centimeter tail. Two individuals have a 26 centimeter tail. And 496 individuals have somewhere in between. So in order to tell how many loci, how many genes are involved in this trait, I want you to consider the individuals that have a parental phenotype. Okay, So we have 2 out of 500 that have the short parent phenotype and 2 out of 500 that have the long parent phenotype. Two out of 500 could be simplified down to one out of 250. Now, if we were considering only one gene, we'd expect this number to be more like one quarter. Um, but let's think how many genes multiplied together. Remember, we're using our multiplicative um, rule of probability here. So one gene... Uh, two genes, that's going to be one out of 16, so it's not the same as 250. Um, three genes, one out of 64. Four genes, that's one out of 256. So I'll say approximately one out of 250, one out of 256. Our best guess for this should be that there are four genes contributing to tail length. We can do the same, we could do the same uh, calculation with the other parent, where we consider this to be about 1 out of 250, and that's the same as one gene being homozygous, a second, a third, and a fourth gene all being big A, big A, big B, big B, big C, big C, big D, big D. It's going to be a pretty rare genotype, and it's going to occur about 1 out of 250 or 2 out of 500 offspring. There are four genes contributing to tail length in these mice. So we'll, we may do some practice problems like this, and you may see a problem like this on the exam. Bring any questions you have to class.